Hey, health fix junkies, it's Teresa Lear Levine from Becoming More Me, the podcast for busy minded entrepreneurs that want to be more and do less. Blessed to have appeared on not just one, but three episodes of The Health Fix. So I encourage you to check out episode 445, 411, and 322 of The Health Fix podcast, where I talk about breaking up with your old self, self sabotage fears, and thriving through life's changes, <clears throat> perimenopause, using EFT tapping and hypnotherapy. You're listening to the Health Fix Podcast. Here's your amazing host, Dr. Janine Kraus. Hey, health junkies. This episode of the Health Fix Podcast kicks off a two-part interview series with Jonathan Marion. If that name sounds familiar, that's because he was on the podcast episode 456, where we talked all about being present in your life. Jonathan Marion is a cultural anthropologist, author, speaker, and health coach with a widely diverse base of knowledge. In part one of this two-part series, we're going to talk about insecurities and attachment styles and their impact on your relationships and stress levels. In part two, we'll be talking about the art of relating to others and navigating rejection. I've been diving into the nervous system a lot lately, especially the vagus nerve. And it's clear to me that to optimize your health, it's crucial to assess your relationship with yourself and others, as these are often the areas of hidden threats to your nervous system that can potentially hinder your health and growth personally. So lots of good nuggets in this podcast. Let's introduce you or reintroduce you to Jonathan Marion. Hey, Health Junkies, I have Jonathan Marion back on because we didn't finish our conversation. We might have a few conversations that we need to kind of keep, you know, going along the way here because there's just so much to learn when it comes to you, your health, your relationship health and things of that nature. So Jonathan, thanks for coming back on to chat with me. Absolutely. My pleasure to be back on Janine and uh, delighted to continue our conversation. Yeah. So at the end of our last podcast, we were starting to talk about relationships, consciousness, and and how all that ties in. And, and you had mentioned attachment styles. And this is something that, you know, I'm, I've heard of it, right? But I'm not super familiar. I've never talked about it on the podcast. And since we've, you know, had a little time between this podcast and the last, I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know, the number one thing, second to people telling me they're tired, is that when I ask them, are they stressed? They're like, my life's great. They're looking externally, right? They're like, everything's great there. And then they're like, but maybe there's something internally or maybe there's a relationship issue going on or a communication issue. So I was like, oh, today's a perfect day to talk. Do you seem to see that too in, in the universe in which you're working with folks where they're looking externally, but not quite internally on how these relationships cause some strife for them? Yeah, I think that's absolutely on point. And so- Obviously, there are people who are dissatisfied because the external measures aren't what they want. Right. Um, and that's one thing. But then what you're bringing up right now is sometimes the external really are sort of in alignment. And then people get confused. They're going, wait a minute, the things I was aiming for, I do have, but somehow it's not as meaningful, fulfilling, satisfying as I thought. And that's usually because of those internal relational types of dynamics. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I think a lot of us, I mean, myself included, I never really thought about how certain relationship dynamics could really cause a huge amount of stress, even though you love the person, but you're like, huh, every time they say that or every time this happens, I am a wreck. Let's go into that a little bit. I'm sure you've probably <laughs> heard lots. You're smiling. So I'm sure you've heard lots of different versions of that. Sure. So one of the things that we had spoken about last time and that I think is applicable here is so often we have these ideas of the way things should be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those are, you know, sort of overt expectations and we can voice them. At the same time, there's often these deeply internalized frameworks and models that we don't even realize that we are holding subconsciously. If someone loves me, 
they should be expressing it in this way. If we have a healthy relationship, it should work like this. And as I had voiced last time, should is fighting with what is. And so I think a lot of the times, one of the causes of strife is that we have expectations that we don't even realize we have. And so it's not that there's even necessarily anything wrong or unhealthy, but there's a mismatch between an expectation that we don't even realize we have and how things are really playing out. Okay. Okay. And I can see where we can get attached to that expectation. Now, is this where attachment styles kind of start to come into play? I think it overlaps. So okay. attachment theory, the way it's commonly thought about is it sort of is a uh, stems out of psychoanalytic theory back in the fifties with um, Bowlby and Ainsley. And uh, then later there were some ex or sorry, uh, Ainsworth, Bowlby and Ainsworth. And then later Harlow did some experiments, um, you know, with uh, even monkeys and uh, using baby monkeys in a wire frame one wrapped with terry cloth, one without, and with like bottles. And part of what emerged in the research was that there's not just physical care, such as a bottle with milk, but there's emotional care and what's actually comforting. And so the model, and, and there's some sub variants of it now, but the model of attachment uh, styles and attachment theory is that there is the possibility of secure attachment. So this starts in infancy, but it's this idea of, sure, an infant's introduced to a new situation and it may be a little unsettling, but they're very quickly comforted when you know they find, whether it's mother, parental, trusted figure, and they're just secure. So yeah, it's a little unsettling, but they're secure and they you know settle down very easily. There's also what is then looked at and termed as anxious attachment. And that's when we're sort of anxious about whether we're going to have that comfort or not. And what happens with a lot of that dynamic as we get older, if we don't realize it, is it's the, you know, you feel close to someone, but you're always wanting reassurance. You're always trying to get them to signal back because you're anxious about how stable is that attachment. Okay. There's also avoidant, which is you've sort of probably very early on, and a lot of this imprints, you know, pre-verbally as infants. Um, with avoidant, it's we learn that we can't count on someone, a caregiver actually coming to our emotional rescue. And so we stop even reaching out. And so then later in life, these are the people who don't put themselves out there because, you know, they know that they can't count on anyone meeting them there. And there's then also sort of sometimes referred to as anxious avoidant or disorganized, where it's features of both of those anxious and avoidant, because the, as a child, as an infant, you never actually learned one strategy because it was too unpredictable. Okay. The one thing I want to say is all the research backs up that even though that's where we all start, everyone can learn earned secure attachment. So even if you didn't grow up with secure attachment, we can learn that it can be earned in how we relate to people. So I just want to put that out there before we go further so that no one gets it in their head of, you know, oh crap, I'm screwed. <laughs> we can all learn earned secure attachment as we learn how to have relationships with people who can meet us where we need to be met. That's, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because you, you've probably heard of people doing the like love languages um, assessments and then the Enneagram, you know, however you say that, I think I said it right. I don't know. Um, you know, all these assessments, right? And then you see these assessments and you're like, that's me for life, right? We start to think like, oh, crap. like my love language? Can I change it? I don't know. So I'm guessing there's some overlap with attachments and love languages and, and all how those things play in too, as we're looking through them. So to the best of my understanding, there isn't a correlation per se, okay. but where it does overlap is that 
the idea of attachment style is, you know, how do we actually have these secure emotional bonds? Mm -hmm. Well, if someone is trying to love you, but using a vector, one of the love languages, which isn't what resonates for you, then they may love you a lot and they may be trying to express it a lot, but it's never going to land because it's not in the way that you need to receive love. And I think one of the mistakes that too many people make with the idea of the love languages is looking at it as, a, oh, this is what I need and stopping there. It's a great thing. It's important to be able to say to someone else, you know, this is what's going to register for me. But part of the point is we also want to relate to other people. It needs to be relational. It's not just taking from people. And so if we're familiar with love languages, it's not, these are my love languages and therefore that's what I'm going to give someone else. It's no, these are my love languages. That's what I need to receive, but I need to find out what their love languages are. And even though it may not come naturally to me, express it in the way that's going to register for them. Okay. Okay. And so of course, guys, I, I diverted us a little bit to love languages because in my head, I'm like, love languages, attachment, are these things, you know, connected? So, okay. So we can rewire ourselves when it comes to attachments and, and these attachment hangups, how, how does this show up? Let's, let's talk a little bit about how it shows up. Cause I think for a lot of people that might be thinking like, do I have an attachment thing going on that I need to work with? Let's, let's talk about those. What are the most common ones? Yeah. So Again, if someone has secure attachment, then, you know, they have a real gift from whoever brought them up um, and raised them. And they learned that they can count on other people and, you know, they're probably doing fine. And it's not to say that they don't have ups and downs in their relationships. We all do, but they don't have an underlying pattern that's getting in the way. For people who have anxious attachments, and I'll just be, uh, you know, transparent up front, I actually had the most maladaptive one uh, as far as my upbringing. So anxious, avoidant, or disorganized. So um, I'm speaking from both sides of that. So with the anxious part, it's whenever you do feel close, there's somehow a distrust that it'll remain. And it's not necessarily a distrust of the other person. Oftentimes it might be a distrust even that you feel worthy. And so you keep reaching out for reassurance. And that can be really maladaptive because someone else may feel like, look, I'm meeting where you are and you keep needing more and more and more reassurance. And so sometimes this can come across as very needy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know back in 2019, when I had the bad spinal injury and was laid up, one of the newer friends I had met uh, earlier that year when I was down in Brazil you know, I was reaching out to, and I didn't realize I was overdoing it. Um, but I was in a place where I was really needy because like life was really sort of tumultuous and I was needing all this reassurance. And I eventually got a message from them, um, an email just basically saying, look, I'm not discounting like the friendship we've had, but I'm not able to provide what you clearly are looking for in this friendship right now. And I'm out. Um, that was a tough pill to swallow, but in the long run, I really thank them for having been that transparent. They didn't just sort of ghost me. They didn't, you know, sort of make up something else. They said what it was and it could really bring it to my mind and I could really think through, okay, what's going on from my end? And of course, that is going to be overwhelming. We've all interacted with people who, you know, you give them some and they keep wanting more and more. I think it's really important to differentiate between who are people who are just trying to take advantage of us versus people who, you know, it's not to say give more than you're comfortable giving, but there's a difference between an intentional action, trying to take advantage versus people who just really become draining. And for our own sake, we need to you know, have some boundaries and pull back. But so that's where anxious can really get in the way because you keep needing these reassurances and sometimes you're asking for more than someone's comfortable giving and you don't even realize that's what you're doing. And so in asking for more and more reassurance in different ways, you actually push them further away. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I could see that. I could see that. I mean, I definitely, you know, with the patient doctor relationship, you know, sometimes I can see that too. And yes, that differentiation is like, are they trying to push the limits or do they, you know, what, what's going on here? How, how would someone differentiate really between someone taking advantage of the situation and someone more just like they're anxious, they really are anxious and, and have that attachment? Yeah. So I think that as we mentioned last time, like there is no the right answer to anything. Sure. Uh, but for the most part, if we really tune into who is this person, where are they coming from? Why is this important to them? Is it that they're trying to take or is it that they need, mm -hmm. right? So are they trying to sort of leverage so that they have more from you or is it that they're actually something is empty for them versus they're just trying to accumulate mm -hmm. and you know are we going to get it right all the time no we're human but i think if i can step back far enough to not be like this is draining but to really look and like where is this person coming from then oftentimes i can tell the difference between someone who clearly there's some underlying insecurity versus someone who's trying to play me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with context too, I, I would assume in terms of the context in which you meet someone, the context in which you could see what is going on, let's say that. Now, with attachments, of course, you know, we're talking relationships and, and relationships don't have to necessarily just be a intimate type of relationship. We can talk like you were saying friends, but also business relationships. I find that a lot of business relationships can become strained because of different attachment issues as well. What have you seen across the board in terms of folks you've worked with? Yeah, so... If I could, I want to rewind and also talk about yeah. the avoidant attachment and then oh, yeah, come yeah. back to this, yeah. because I think we need to look at both of those to really answer. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about the anxious one. The avoidant one is someone who at some point internalized this idea that they can't count on other people. And so they never reach out for help because the underlying unconscious idea is, you know, if I do, I'll be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And if I, I don't think it's a conscious realization, but the underlying logic is if I don't ask, I can't be turned down. No one, there can't say no if they're not given an opportunity to. Mm -hmm. And so you're avoiding that pain, emotional pain of being let down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And obviously at a certain stage, that was a strategy that was more comforting or cause less pain than the other. And we don't really adjust it when we get older until we really do the work and think it through. And so where this shows up later are people who are like, you know, I don't need anyone. Um, I'm not gonna, you know, I don't want to work with other people. Um, I'm not going to ask that person out on a date because, you know, they're going to make up a reason why, but underlying it is, you know, they find it so painful to be, have a no, to not be met where they are that, you know, they've learned to just not even ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see so, that. yeah. So now let's come back to that question about in different types of relationships. So I think one of the really important things that I think gets overlooked is that if we're really talking about lived experience, there actually isn't such a thing as a relationship. And what I mean by that is it's not a thing. It's not out there. It's not separate from the people involved. There's relating. It's an ongoing process. And I think it tends to be unintentionally, but often in a way that becomes at least somewhat dysfunctional, a cop-out to say, I'm doing this for the sake of the relationship. Well, what does that mean? If it's really about what we're 
labeling as a relationship, it really should be about relating with another person or other people. What is in the service of relating is a very different framework mm -hmm. than what's in the service of the relationship as if it's one static thing. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happywholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not gonna remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, you know, I think thinking through all these different types of interactions, let's put it that way, can sometimes be overwhelming for for a human just in general general to kind of figure out you know how am i playing into this am i showing up as me am i showing up with attachments am i showing up what does someone do if you know i, I guess it's probably at this point where i'm like well what do you do if you suspect you have one or you're you know showing up that way what are what are some signs what are some um you know, I think we've talked about science, but what are like some things that folks can start doing to to get into the rewiring process? Yeah, I think that's so important. And so, again, we all have neuroplasticity. We all can learn new patterns. The fact that we all have sort of an underlying, you know, default wherever we're starting from, yeah, it's real, but it doesn't mean that we have to act on it. Mm -hmm. So... For example, I was aware of the fact that I had the anxious part, you know, since for quite a while. I didn't realize till later I also had the avoidant. But with the anxious, you know, if there was someone who, whether a friend, a potential romantic interest, whatever it was, who I would reach out to, and if I didn't hear back from them within a certain time frame, my natural inclination was to send another message or to send another message or to send another message, you know, and keep like sort of trying to get engagement. But once I realized where that was coming from, sure, that might still be the default inclination, but I don't have to act on it. I can sort of back off and whether just in my own head, whether talking to friends and family, whether talking to a coach, whether working with a therapist or a healer from whatever tradition I believe in, I can start to go, wait a minute, what would be a reasonable amount of time to wait for a response before I try engaging again? And so, what, about two years ago, year and a half ago, um, I would have had a, something like this. I was in Ireland at the time, and my natural inclination was, nope, you know, I need to send another message, and I haven't heard from this person. I need to know what's going on. And it was like, no, what's reasonable here is to wait two weeks and see. And sure enough, like about a day before the two weeks was going to be over, I got a message saying, so sorry for not having been in touch. I got COVID. I'm just recovering. Um, but I do hope to catch up with you when I'm fully recovered. What would it have come across like if this person is sick, you know, having trouble like breathing and going about their daily life, and yet... They're getting message after message, basically asking for a response. Mm -hmm. And so, sure, the inclination may be there and we may not be able to rewire that, you know, at the click of a button. But if we can recognize where it's coming from and then step, put that to the side and say, OK, step by step, what actually makes sense here? What's giving them a chance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now they can meet you. And yeah, you may need some support to process whatever is coming up because yeah, you get anxious. There's some stress, there's some insecurity, but we're human. That's part of being human. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. This brings up for me, <laughs> folks might laugh at this. It's like the customary, you go on a date with someone and then there's like three days before you contact them. That's like, you know, the customary wait period. And if someone, you know, hits you up before that, there's this like, oh, they must really like me kind of thing. And so <laughs> I'm getting into this in my head only because I'm like, how, how do you go across what you have in your head about what's customary and what's like in, in your head? Is this in, how do you weed that out? between am i am i avoidant am i am i consciously doing this because i've been trained that i need to wait three days i i think it, the only reason i'm saying is because it's like i hear this from my friends who are single all the time they're like yep there's that three-day rule and i'm like okay what is this an attachment thing is this a is this a customary thing what what are we doing here psychologically what's happening with this three three-day rule yeah i don't think that on its own that is attachment style because when you're just talking about like an initial date or two, it's not yet at that level, usually. That said, I do think there's an element of it because there are the people who are going to go, wait a minute, I thought it went great and I haven't heard from them for a few days. You know, do they are they not interested? You're also going to have the people who go, well, they responded that quick. Are they desperate? And so I think this is where we're falling prey to just are in our ideas about what social norms are. And to me, if it's really about relating to people authentically and connecting authentically, then my take is if you want to get in touch with someone sooner, just say, look, I don't know if this is one of those things where I'm supposed to wait X amount of time, but I really enjoyed our time and I'd like to get together again or have another conversation. And so acknowledge that there are these bizarre social uh, considerations and that we don't quite know where they come from or what they're supposed to signal, but just be authentic about, you know, how you thought it went. And yeah, I, I like that. I like that. Just be real and, and make fun of the social norm if, <laughs> if it, if it helps you feel better about things, but okay. Cause you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to think of what folks might be asking me about attachment styles and, and of course going in, you know, from relationship, but to your doctor patient relationship too. This is a big one where these show up. So I'd love to hear your take on these. Yeah. So I think one of the places where I see some corollaries is actually with avoidance. Mm -hmm. And so the people who've learned that they can't count on others mm -hmm. um, and that they need to sort of do it themselves. Well, I think that at some level, there's a cultural version of that where not everyone, everyone's an individual, but by and large, men have been socialized more to need to, you know, sort of quote, buck up and, you know, therefore they don't actually seek help, seek medical advice, go in for something. And it's related. It's part of why men have, you know, the stress levels and probably it's related to, you know, younger mortality on average. And as far as attachment styles, it comes from attachment styles. This isn't necessarily about attachment to a physician, a doctor, but it's like, how do we learn to seek comfort? Mm -hmm. And so I know in late 2019, when I had the spinal injury and the nerve damage and couldn't even roll over for five weeks, you know, my inclination is not to reach out to people. And... I really had to say, this isn't going to work. I literally cannot even roll over, let alone take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And so I had to put it on, you know, my socials, you know, anyone who's local to the area and can come help out for 10, 15 minutes a day. I need you to refill my water bottle, mix me a protein shake and empty a portable urinal. I cannot move. I cannot roll on a side. And Yes, there were people who I thought were going to be there and didn't show up. And that was disappointing. At the same time, there were people who came out of the woodwork who I would not have predicted in a hundred guesses, a thousand guesses. And I think that's the thing that when we're coming from an avoidant place, we need to realize is sometimes our needs will get met by people we wouldn't expect and in ways we wouldn't expect. And that we've cut off the possibility of that 
if we never outgrow that pattern. Basically, anytime you don't ask, the answer is no. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a fun one I learned from my mom years ago. And it's completely different context. But <laughs> the answer is no, if you don't ask. And, and that's the that's you know, important to think about because I think for a lot of people who have kind of the the style of avoidance, you know, I can see where a lot of folks will get stressed because they don't have help, but they, and then I'm like, well, did you ask anyone? No. So, you know, it's, it comes down to that too. Now with, with working, you know, culturally, cause I, of course, as I mentioned, the first podcast, I was fascinated with cultural anthropology and how attachment styles like go across culture. You know, it, obviously there's three styles for a reason. We all kind of have them dependent, you know, independent of our, our culture. Are there interesting twists that you've noticed in the different countries you've lived in, the different folks you've worked with in terms of cultural styles with attachment and how it shows up? Yeah. So I think that's such a compelling question. And I haven't done the research on it. That said, my background, my PhD is actually in psychological anthropology, which is about that permeable border between personality and culture. Mm -hmm. And where I think this overlaps the most is that what counts as a display of care, what counts as meeting needs is very cultural. Mm -hmm. And so in all cases, it's what we very early on imprint and learn, you know, do our needs get taken care of? Do they not get taken care of? Um, you know, do we learn that they won't be taken care of no matter what, and therefore we become avoidant? Do we learn that, you know, we really need to cling and that's how we can sort of get a little more attention than we feel because we're insecure? But what counts as meeting those things? That's very culturally variable. And so, you know, one of the things that becomes very interesting is we learn how things are, quote, supposed to be. Again, it's those shoulds. Mm -hmm. And so you can grow up in places where there were very different expectations of the roles of each of the parents. And whereas in our culture, we might say, look, some of why someone, you know, isn't adapted the way we think they should be is because, you know, the parental roles weren't filled. Well, mm -hmm. that's just not true because if you don't have an expectation of that's how those roles get filled, if they get filled in a different way and you learn that's normal, that counts just as much. It doesn't have to be any one way. And so that's where I think there's a huge cultural overlay because do we have as parents expectations of how these things should work, of how we should be interacting with or without another parental figure? Um, or even parental figures in more blended families. And outside of modern Western society, most child rearing isn't in a nuclear family. It's much more communal. And so it's actually very unnatural for it to be so such a small unit. And so it's probably exacerbated within the context that, you know, those of us, especially in the US, North America, the West have grown up in, where it's much less communal effort in rearing of children, where we have much more neo-locality of, you know, parents and kids living in a different location than extended family. Because if you're living in an environment where there's many more adult caregivers are just part of your day-to-day -day circle, you have a better odd of actually getting some, you know, attachment needs met very early on. And so that's probably much more adaptive in the long run. Interesting concept, because I was thinking while you're talking about, you know, folks who have more parental care, especially in the Latino uh, populations, you know, I lived in Mexico for over a year and, and just saw like, you know, you've got your mom, but you, your aunt, your grandma, like everybody's all around, tend to be all in the same block, right? And so you're bouncing around between all of them at any given time. And so I can see how that would be more of an adaptive kind of uh, response to, to things of that nature. So maybe if some folks are listening right now and, and they've got some kids or grandkids, is there any advice that you would give in terms of, of helping support attachment, you know, types of styles and relationships? What kind of things could folks do in, in that case? 
Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. The first is anytime, because where is it the hardest to express, you know, um, love and affection? It's like when we're stressed out, when we're, you know, at wit's end. And so if rather than looking at any type of behavior as acting up, acting out, troublemaking, we look at it as this is a signal that they need attachment and they need security. That's because they just don't have the framework. They don't have the vocabulary. They don't have the emotional awareness mm -hmm. to say, I'm feeling unattached. I'm feeling insecure. Mm -hmm. And so all of those are basically just a cry, a plea for, I need to feel more securely attached. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to start there. And I think we can then sort of go, okay, what's actually going on? How can I meet the emotional need first, then we can turn to whatever the behavioral issue is and help train our children with more emotional intelligence and better coping strategies than we grew up with. The second piece of that is it can be really taxing. And so you need supports as well. Mm -hmm. And so you need to build what's your safety net, what's your support network, because it's really tough. And it's not just a matter of switching something in your head. When a kid is screaming nonstop and no matter what you do is wrong, you know, that's tiring, that's stressful. Mm -hmm. So what are your resources and what are resources that you can bring in as far as other secure figures, if that's possible? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that you can use as outlets and as supports for yourself? This isn't the same thing, but... I think it's an important side point here, which is the biggest gift that we can give children is breaking cycles of this. Mm -hmm. And I have one friend um, who is just, she blows me away when I watch what she's doing because she left a very abusive situation and setting, doesn't have support, um, has to actually be, you know, has a legal case going on right now. Um, but I didn't even need to see it, but just even seeing how she posts about her daughter mm -hmm. and what she shares, that kid is so securely attached. It's absurd. And when I actually mentioned this to my friend, they're like, I feel so seen. I didn't even realize other people noticed it, but yeah, she's super secure. And this isn't what my friend grew up with, mm -hmm. but, you know, she's made it a priority to say the most important thing I can do is make sure that this child feels secure. And even though her own environment is anything but, and again, she's dealing with legal, financial, all of that, we don't need to, it is part of what our life is, but how much can we insulate our kids from that? How much can we show up to them with you're cared for, you're loved, you're taken care of, and then fine, break down if you need to, but find where and how to do it in a way that doesn't take away from the security of our children. It's huge. That's huge. Because I think right now what we're seeing so much of is a, a lot of parents who are going, oh gosh, what have I done? Uh, you know, the rethinking, like, how do I, how do I change these things? How do I rewire myself? But how do I also help my, my kids to rewire from what's, what's happening? And, and I think this is a big stressor for a lot of people. Yeah. I think the most important first step there is self-compassion. No matter who you are, who's listening to this, you've done the best you could until now. If you knew better or had more resources before, you would have done something different. So this is not about self-recrimination. This is not about you've done anything wrong. You did the best you could, and that's the best any of us can. Mm -hmm. But with a new awareness, what can you do now? And depending on the age of you know, your child or children, have a conversation. Say, look, I recognize that maybe this didn't come across the way I intended it. 
how did that feel? How did that make you feel? You know, what would work better? What can we do as a family um, or, you know, as parent child to have a healthier, more adaptive pattern going forward? Again, it's about relating. It's not there's a relationship and it's a thing that's fixed forever. It's relating. It's organic. It's living. It changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting concept because I think a lot of us don't think about relating versus relationships. That's that's a profound difference in at least in my brain too to be able to converse with someone right or to be able to dialogue I guess in general converse dialogue and and have that and and perhaps maybe that's where some of the rewiring comes into play for us adults on our on our own levels. And with that deep thought, we're going to hold off till next episode to talk about relating and how relating plays into relationships, whether it's business, personal, friendships, and how we perceive our relating to others. Fascinating stuff here. Next podcast, we'll also dive into rejection and how that plays into stress and navigating this thing, the vagus nerve, and our responses to stress. So hold tight for the next episode. We'll keep this conversation going. Hey, Health Junkies, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again.